Talk is in Egypt, and my next guest is Yusri Fouda, the television journalist who's taken his own show off air in a protest aimed at this country's military rulers. Are the forces of repression making a comeback? Yosri Fuda, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you so much, Steve, for having me. I want to begin by taking you back to those extraordinary days of January and February this year, the revolution. Yeah. Did you feel liberated as a journalist as well as an Egyptian citizen? Yes, on, on both levels, yes. I mean, those days were full of tremendous hope. Uh, and, and, and you lived it minute by minute, and, and you see your people who, for uh, such a long time, everybody believed that Egyptians are servile and they wouldn't revolt and they just have it lying down and, 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 and so on. And to see it uh, for yourself and actually be part of it was a moment of pride, great pride. And this idea that, that it was going to be a, a seminal sort of watershed moment for the media, I want to focus on what you decided to do after those days of revolution. You were very keen to establish, I think, a, a new form of journalism and, and base it on rigorous, challenging interviews, maybe not so dissimilar to what we do on Hard Talk. And you uh, developed a program, The Final Word. Yes. Um, yeah. Did you really believe that the Egypt that had come from this revolution was an Egypt that was ready for no holds barred, rigorous, challenging questioning of the people at the very top, those in power. I will give you one example. The first interview that I did with two generals from SCAF, SCAF is the military council, uh, which is in charge of the country after the revolution. Um, I had some preliminary sessions with them discussing what was it was going to be all about, and they were very receptive. Uh, they were a little bit edgy when it came to certain points because at the time there were some very negative uh, stories as far as they are concerned, including uh, virginity tests, claims of uh, torture, and the rest of it. And these weren't just claims. I mean, we now know these were true. Yeah. Yes. Unfortunately, yes. Uh, we have uh, a lot of evidence now. I, I, I mean, as a journalist, yeah, I wasn't there to see it for myself, but it's just the evidence is, uh, has, is, is compelling. But yes. in a way, that's the point. You know, you were having preliminary discussions with, with generals, with men in uniform. You were trying to persuade them to open up, to open up to challenging, rigorous questioning. But at the very same time, you were living in a country which is still under a state of emergency, yes. where people who say the wrong thing can end up before a military court and can end up in a military prison. Yes. There was no way, was there, that you could do the job you wanted to do? Um, to a certain extent, uh, that's, um, that's true. But also, you, uh, I believe that every single party in this country has been going through a learning process, including the army. And I realized this from the beginning. Uh, they are, by nature, very simple. The army, by nature, is very conservative. Now, they are in charge of uh, a country uh, which is exploding with hopes and wishes for the immediate future. Uh, what can they do? You, you try to understand their position. They try as much as they can to understand uh, why is it that you are insistent to discuss this point or, or, or that uh, during the interview. So I said to them, I'm going to ask about everything. And they said, what do you mean everything? I said, including virginity tests. And they looked at each other. and. and and, 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 and said, I said, I know I'm, I'm either this, this is just one example, and, you know, mm. including other things as well, uh, or I'm not, I, I don't think I can do the interview. Well, in the end, I'm going to ask the question, and you can say no comment, but in itself is an answer. That was then, and we're going back a few months now, but uh, in the more immediate past, and indeed only just a few hundred meters from here, we've had a truly terrible event. I mean, many people call it the Maspiro Massacre. Yeah. We saw more than two dozen Coptic Christians killed, it seems, by the security forces. All of the video evidence and other evidence suggests that is the case. Now, as a result of that, 
there has been, it seems, a new crackdown on freedom of expression. How did that manifest itself for you? It's been coming for, uh, for a few months now. Basically, to cut a long story short, uh, sometimes indirect pressure is much worse than direct pressure. And what do you mean by indirect pressure? Uh, you have two paradigms in, in terms of uh, uh, media ownership in Egypt. The uh, directly state-controlled uh, paradigm, and so easy for whoever happens to be in power to control it. And that paradigm, which started in Egypt a few years ago, uh, privately owned uh, media, some newspapers, some uh, satellite channels. And I'm part of that. Uh, and we've been really struggling, uh, uh, whether under Mubarak or actually indeed now. The only difference between <laughs> the Mubarak uh, uh, era and those few months after the revolution is that the Mubarak era got used to that and they were a little bit more clever playing with the um, privately owned uh, media. Uh, now, I'm afraid you are going through the whole process over and over again with the military. Here you sit uh, representing on TV, as you say, owned by one of Egypt's richest men, doing your interview show. After the Nespiro incident, you want to put together a show which analyzes the army's reaction, uh, involving one of the leading uh, opponents of the military regime, the writer Ala Aswani. The plan is there for the program, and then at the last minute, you pull it. The yes. program never happens. Why? Uh, there were some uh, direct reasons, but also, uh, to be honest, uh, accumulation of so many things. I mean, th that particular story started a day earlier when it was announced that two uh, SCAF members, two military generals, were going to appear uh, on another channel uh, with two of my colleagues. So I called the uh, uh, head of the channel and I said, it's going to be a waste of time actually to go, because it goes almost at the same time, my show. Everybody will be watching. I would like to watch. So I announced on Twitter that uh, we're going to repeat an old uh, episode because uh, I would like everybody to have the chance to watch the generals. Tomorrow we'll have the analysis. And then I announced that Alaa Al Aswani uh, and Ibrahim Isa, uh, who was actually one of the, uh, the two colleagues uh, interviewing the generals. Um, the day after, which was the day we were supposed to analyze that, uh, you started to feel the heat coming uh, through uh, from different directions. No, 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 this is where it gets important. What do you yeah. mean by heat? Are journalists like you today mm -hmm. in Egypt directly threatened? They wouldn't do it directly. They would. This is the, this is what really gets me, and this is why actually I'm making this stance, because they would love to have the cake and eat it. They would love for you to uh, exercise self-censorship and you know, get in line without even uh, getting their hands dirty in the process. And, and, I, and I have an issue with that. If you don't like what I report, come out and say, I don't like what you report, I suspend you. And that's what I wanted to do. But because it was maybe more subtle than that, a lot of people in this country don't understand why you eventually announced that you were no longer prepared to because do your Steve, program. Because, Steve, this is, the, this is what I'm talking about in terms of the ownership. Businessmen who own channels now, they are, their position is very fragile. Well, let's be very honest about this. Your channel is owned by Nagib Sawiris, mm. one of, if not the, richest man in the whole of Egypt. Are you saying to me he was not prepared to back you taking on and confronting the military no. rulers of this country? No one can do that. Everybody has a limit. I, this is a word of credit, actually, that Nagib Sawiris has always, always supported me, never intervened in my work, never told me what to do or what not to, de not to do, always left it to my judgment to do it my way. This is why I volunteered until the very last minute. The head of the, head of the channel was actually begging me to go on air. I said to him, no, somebody has to draw the line somewhere. Because if, if, if they don't, I mean, for God's sake, they went into a channel with machine guns on, on, on that bloody Sunday. I'm not going to wait until they go into my studio when I'm live with machine guns. You think it has got to that? You think there is now a situation in this country where the military is prepared, if necessary, to use direct force against an independent media? 
I'm, I, I believe that it's not a zero-sum game. This is why I am making my stance in the fashion that I'm making it. I don't want to destroy things. Well, this is, not, with, with this respect, is not the moment. But when you said, after you suspended the program and walked out of that studio, you said, it is no secret that much of the pre-revolutionary mentality is imposed on, upon us today, and you said, if not worse yes. now. Yes. So you're essentially saying the guys who rule this country today are worse than Mubarak. In the sense that they don't have the experience that the Mubarak regime had. Both are bad, and I have to say it. When, when you don't believe in... Uh, if you're afraid of a camera, then you must have something to hide. It's, it's as simple as this. This is number one. And if you don't believe in the freedom of the press, uh, and you still try to convince me that you are backing a revolution, I would say to you, I'm sorry. The, the, the only difference is that they are not experienced. They are army people. They've never dealt with the, you know, civil issues before. They needed some reminding, number one. They, they needed someone to explain to them what this was all about. You wanted to make a stand, and I dare say you didn't mind the fact that many of the revolutionary forces in this country saluted you for the stand you made. But what about your audience. There are people across this country who tuned into your show to see <coughs> one journalist who was prepared to ask the tough questions and you walked away and you betrayed uh, your audience. Uh, I'm not walking out and I, and I declared this on Twitter immediately after the, st the statement. I'm not walking away from the square, from the field. I'm making a stand and I'm coming back. I'm giving SCAF, the military, a chance to come up with some sort of a, a statement or, or whatever they, you know, can. But well, at this, hang on, at, hang at the on. Same they, they time. already have. I mean, first of all, I spoke the other day to the information minister, Osama Haikel. He said, look, Yosri Fuda isn't telling the truth. The military regime does not want to manipulate and control the media. We do want to see the flowering of free expression. And mm. after I heard that, I saw that the, a member of the uh, Supreme Council of the Armed Forces had actually called into the media and said, well, and Mr. said, hang on, I acknowledge that Yosri Fuda is a skilled, efficient, professional media person. There's been an internal misunderstanding, but he must return to his natural place on air. Steve, it's not only about me. I did this for the whole atmosphere to, you know, begin to change at least and appreciate why am I doing this. And, I, you know, with every with every due respect and appreciation for what uh, General uh, Itman uh, uh, said, uh, but still remain more, many more questions than answers. But at the same time, I am not standing uh, doing nothing. I am joining a few of my colleagues who believe in uh, the freedom of press. Uh, well, I, 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 I want to ask you about that because I began this interview by asking you whether now you feel you were somewhat naive at the beginning of this revolutionary period. And uh, naivety is a point that I come back to because now you say you want to found a, a new independent television network, something Egypt's never seen before, not run by big businessmen, not run by the state, but truly owned by the people. Owned by the people. Mm. How can that possibly happen? Uh, everything starts with a dream, a little dream, and I hope that at least people in power realize that there is a third way. I don't want them to think that this is the end of it. I don't want them to think that we can take it lying down. You talk with great passion about the new independent journalism you want to see in this country, but isn't it true that maybe nations get the journalism and the journalists they deserve and right now right here in Egypt there is substantial evidence that many journalists are themselves stuck in an old way of thinking and perhaps we saw that best at Egypt State TV the way they reported the Maspira the way they said that that cops were attacking the army that three soldiers had been killed by violent Coptic yes, crowds but nice. I just wonder whether you believe the state media in this country has to be completely dismantled after that recent incident and the way that state TV reported it this is what one uh, journalist inside state television Dina Rasmi this is what she said she said she was ashamed now of working for the state media she said that it had proven itself to be a slave for whoever rules Egypt if that is the case does it need to be utterly dismantled 
It's not our, remember, this is a revolution. A revolution, I believe, did happen in Egypt, but there is one very crucial fact. The revolutionary forces were never allowed to rule. So <clears throat> if something goes wrong now, it's not the fault of the revolution. It's the fault who, of, of whoever you know, were, uh, was in control and still in control of the country. So I'm not going to throw the blame on, on my colleagues uh, inside Maspiro. I believe that the vast majority of them are victims. They, they just can't do it. But I do, I do bl blame some, some of them sometimes when they have the chance to make a stance and they choose not to. Okay, that's why. I mean, I'm not going to blame someone who has a family to raise uh, that they should come out and say everybody does what you know, whatever they can do. Uh, I just wonder whether you and other uh, journalists, liberals, revolutionaries, maybe we can call them, who are the kinds of people who've been in Tahrir Square, who continue the protests, whether you are in some ways disconnected from ordinary Egyptians, maybe the, the fellahin, the rural workers who populate this country, live on low wages, and who it seems now just want this country to return to stability, yes. to peace, to normality. Do you think they really care about your stand for independent journalism? I think they do. Uh, and they have already shown this uh, uh, since January. Uh, for a few days and I know yes yes the cynical view is that this uh, case is all meant uh, so that the the so-called sil silent majority hate the uh, revolution and the rest of it. It, it it just means that we need to be a little bit uh, more patient and to explain to them what actually is taking place and my whole program was al was actually all about this trying to explain to people give them the the, the other narrative of and the you, story you really believe that, that the messages you were sending out, the sort of Egypt you believe in, connects with those Egyptians who perhaps do not have your ed education, your economic advantages, your social status. You think you can reach them? You know, the revolution came raising three words. Freedom, dignity, social justice. When I compare now after five months, what is it that we have achieved so far? Almost nothing. Almost nothing. What a very bleak conclusion. Well, I, I, well, I have to be pragmatic. Yes, we've gotten rid of Mubarak, Gamal Mubarak, their cronies, and we try to do you know, one or two things here and there. But I look at the country now, and, and I look at what happened in, in Tunisia, and uh, I see more of what we call the flul, the ex, um, you know, the, 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 the main core of the, uh, I, I can't even call it ex-regime, because the regime is still very much with us. And it's not all, it's not actually like what some people uh, uh, say now, that is, they are trying to reproduce the old regime. I think it's all about, preserving the regime because the regime never went away. So you're saying there was no revolution? No, there was a revolution. I'm so proud that the people just to come out and express what you actually feel about y your country and you try to do something about it and at a certain point of time you topple the head of the state in itself is a big... and revolutions actually take years and years to happen and, and, and I think more people uh, now realize this, and more people are prepared to be a little bit more patient. I just want SCAF to realize this, that they are now in charge of a country in transition. Let me ask you a, a, a personal question. You are in a very strange place right now. You are a journalist, a reporter, somebody who is uh, very used to reporting other people's affairs, and suddenly you've become the yeah. story yourself. <laughs> many, yeah. many journalists would say that is a a cardinal error to turn yourself into the story but yeah, that's sort I, of what you I don't like it I don't like it are you I'm sure you don't? maybe there's a no, little bit of I ego here because no. there are people only what 200 300 yards from here who are continuing protests on Tahrir Square and now there are banners saying we are with Yoshri Fuda your name is on but the banners Steve okay with all with all modesty why should I do this if I'm already live on TV almost every day for three hours. Yeah, and I, you know, I can feed my ego easily through my show. I've already reached a, a certain point in my career that I don't need it.
Okay. I just wonder, though, whether you've crossed a fundamental divide from being the observer, the reporter, to being the participant. And maybe, and I don't want to put an idea into your head, but maybe you have decided that the only way to really take part in this revolution in Egypt is actually to get inside the politics of this country, no, to no. play a political role. No, I don't want for that to happen. I, I'm very much aware of the difference between journalism and activism, and I never I never crossed that line. I am now defending my very profession. I am joining forces with other colleagues of mine because we feel worried about our industry, about journalism, because we feel that journalism, free journalism, free press, can play a crucial role in the future of Egypt. Because I do believe <coughs> that information is power, and I know that anyone, especially in our part of the world who is in, in, in power, would hate for the people to be empowered with information. And I want to uh, go on with this struggle to inform my people about what is actually happening so that they can make up their own minds. But a final thought. There is right now a real question about how much freedom of expression Egyptians have. For example, sitting in a military prison right now is a gentleman, young man, Michael Nabil, who was convicted and sentenced to three years of hard labor simply for something he wrote in a blog about the armed forces. Yes. Here today mm -hmm. you've told me that the repressive tactics used by the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces in many ways are worse than what you lived under with Mubarak. You've run a very real risk here. How far are you prepared to take this stand of yours? As far as it takes me you know I'm not gonna you know bow in front of any kind of pressure regarding something that I do not believe in uh, sometimes to contemplate prison? Uh, I don't think they will go as far as this uh, but if should I uh, if I have to then I have to if I'm if if, if I, the thing that I know for sure about myself and it's not only about me here again over and over again, is that once you volunteer self-censorship, you begin losing certain things inside your conscience. Yes, you have to have what we call social responsibility, and you have to have this measure of the moment that your country is going through. And ha I have exercised that throughout my uh, career, especially in the last uh, uh, nine months. But at the same time, I am not going to only take the narrative of the army uh, in regard to this incident or that incident. If I knew that there was another narrative that it is my duty towards my country, <coughs> including the military, this is the point, including the military, because I do believe that I help the military help themselves through knowing the other narrative. This is the whole point. This is why I believe it's not a zero-sum game. This is, this is why I believe, please, do not waste your time and hours. The whole world is over this years and years ago. We belong to a different age now. I can launch my own channel from my bedroom. I can go back to London or go to Doha or to Dubai or to Cyprus or wherever and still tackle the same issues and maybe in a harsher way. I do not want for this to happen. So in a word, your message to them, to the military rulers of this country is you're going nowhere. I'm staying. This is my country, and I'm so proud that I was here at the right moment, in the right place, and I'm so proud and thankful that I had the chance to play a bit of a, of, of, of a role in, 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 in what's been happening. I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying here. I will go back to my program, but things that have been happening over the last few months are not very promising. We deserve much better than this. Yashri Fuda. Thank you for being on Hard Talk. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.